Good evening. Thank you for coming to our uh, NEH lecture for, for this evening. I need to start, with, though, with a quick word of, of, of announcements. Um, for all of our NEH people, I need to encourage you to be sure and check your email. You have several important messages that you need to think about responding to or at least thinking about. Um, they've come today and a couple will come tomorrow. They, they, they concern signing up for your final present presentations and getting some info set up about how you're going to be re receiving your, your funding. So that's a nice thing to know. Um, we also have posted a schedule for some Juneteenth activities if you want to look at those and see what you're interested in. Um, we are also about to have to make our first report on any, on any absent days you've had, so Bruce has written you about that. Be sure you respond. Also, Jordan and Rebecca have invited us to their house. Be sure that you uh, respond to that as well. And um, we were planning a trip to Macon on the 23rd, and we need some folks who are interested in going to think about driving. Um, so if, if that's something that possibly interests you, let us, let us know. End of, end of announcements. Sorry about that. When I first met Tom Haddix, uh, it was, I think, at an American Literature Association. And I have to say, I do nothing about him other than the paper that he gave, but I was very impressed by the depth of his understanding, not just knowledge of literary theory, and the way he gracefully applied it to literature, particularly Flannery O'Connor. He carefully steered his audience to a deeper understanding of the literary text rather than just overcame us with a lot of theoretical jargon. Thank you. Always appreciated. Um, it's just such a balance that I, that I discovered uh, when, when we had more opportunities to, to talk. And that balance in Tom includes his family, his faith, and his teaching, as well as his scholarship. And he manages to embrace them all, and I've never met a scholar that is as typically joyous as you are. Congratulations. The rest of us are, are like, you know, paranoid schizophrenics. <laughs> as a scholar, he's been highly impressive. Uh, he has two monographs that, that I know, Hard Sayings, The Rhetoric of Christian Orthodoxy in the Late Modern Fiction from Ohio State University Press for 2013, and before that, Fears and Fascinations Representing Catholicism in the American South from Fordham University Press in 2005. Both of these are books that sent me scouring for new sources and considering a very diverse range of writers. Also impressive is a volume that he co-edited with Alan Dunn, Limits of Literary Historicism. His journal publications and collection publications are numerous, including On Belief, Conflict, and Universality, Flannery O'Connor, Walter Ben Michaels, and Slavak Zisak in a volume that I was fortunate enough to co-edit. <clears throat> More recently, I've had the op opportunity to see his latest essay from Philosophy and Literature, and it was an honor to get to read an early version of that paper. I highly recommend it. Its title is Diachronicity, Episodicity, get that correct, and the Aesthetic of Historicist Criticism. Finally, as a teacher, he's that rare scholar whose graduate students always, always praise, including at least two associated with the NEH this week, Monica Miller and Matt Bryant Cheney. In fact, in 2021, he was named best faculty mentor inside the classroom by the graduate students in English at the University of Tennessee. It is a great honor to have him with us tonight, both as a scholar and as a, as a person. I present to you Professor Thomas Haddix. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Bob. Um, uh, I think you, you, you did leave off one of my graduate students, Jack Love, um, also from, uh, from, uh, from the UT's MA program. So, uh, <laughs> um, I am thrilled and honored and humbled to be here. Thank you um, so much, Bob and Bruce, for uh, inviting me. Um, as my students can tell you, I like 
block quotes. Um, and so there's a handout that Bruce has um, distributed to you because there are several of them in the talk that I'm going to give tonight. Uh, I just thought it would be easier to follow along when I, when I get to them. So um, I want to approach the topic of this talk, which I'm calling Flannery O'Connor Against Bare Life in an Indirect Manner, by way of an observation made by Sam Chris a couple of years ago in an essay called It's Not All in Your Head. This is quote one on the handout. We are living, Chris maintained, in an age of ambient unwellness. You need only look at how many products are out there promising to make you better. Nootropics to enhance your cognition. Supplements for your bones and your skin and every one of your organs. Microdosing to enhance your creativity. Therapy, of course, for your traumas. New and better sleep regimens unearthly powders and goos to replace all the actual food in your diet. Everything invites you to optimize yourself. The entire self, body and mind, isn't just the thing you are. It's a kind of machinery, something to be fine-tuned and set to work. The dream of a fully frictionless existence, a world of highly efficient cyborgs. Because if you're not perfectly productive, if you let up, even for a moment, you must be sick. The forces of decay will swallow you whole. It's important to note, I think, that Chris does not deny the very real health afflictions, physical and mental, that are widespread in the United States today. The ongoing harms produced by depression, anxiety, poor diet and obesity, drug abuse, environmental contamination, and chronic illness are all evident. And they have contributed significantly to what the media has begun to call deaths of despair. Most strikingly, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has wrought damage that extends far beyond the number of people who have died of the disease itself. We might not know for many years the full measure of the social isolation, delayed development in children, and increases in alcoholism, drug abuse, and suicide that were among its longer-term consequences. When Chris speaks of ambient unwellness, however, he's referring to problems that are less easily identified. Some of the names given to such conditions, such as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, seem to function as medical placeholders. Few would deny the suffering of those who have received these diagnoses, but thus far, we have no idea of its cause. Chris argues that at earlier periods, we gave different names to similarly mysterious disorders. Sigmund Freud, for instance, spoke of hysteria and proposed a comprehensive theory of what it was and how it operated, though his ideas about it have largely been discredited. And Freud, too, held that others before him had identified the same phenomenon using different methods and employing different terminology. As he put it in a letter to Wilhelm Fleiss, my brand new prehistory of hysteria is already well known and was published a hundred times over, though several centuries ago. The medieval theory of possession held by our ecclesiastical courts was identical with our theory of a foreign body and the splitting of consciousness. Given the paucity of conclusive physical evidence associated thus far with fibromyalgia, hysteria, or demonic possession, it's not surprising that some have expressed doubt about whether such conditions are real, imagined, or even the stuff of fraud. Chris cites, for instance, the 1980s panic surrounding allegations of the satanic ritual abuse of children at daycares, which might have suggested that Freud was onto something after all. Yet Chris also underscores that Freud's basic intellectual honesty can no longer be presumed because we have evidence of how far he went to cover up his sometimes disastrous misdiagnoses. Chris himself professes agnosticism about the physical basis of these conditions, even as he remains sympathetic to those who suffer from them. His larger implication, however, is that unwellness becomes diffuse and ambient precisely when the most pervasive harms to human beings are social and cultural rather than physical in nature. As he puts it, I worry that we might be passing over the notion that the values and structures and injustices of our society are bad for us. We validate specific pains and symptoms and ignore the ways in which a damaged world has made being ill 
the only way of being a person. I'm reminded here of a remark by O'Connor's fellow Catholic writer, Walker Percy. Speaking of depression, Percy does not propose a theory of it, but suggests that whatever its origin, it is also an appropriate response to a broken world. In Percy's words, you are entitled to your depression. In fact, you'd be deranged if you were not depressed. Perhaps Percy's point would stand just as well, even if we substituted hysteria or chronic fatigue for depression. Flannery O'Connor was intimately acquainted, of course, with personal unwellness. The lupus that first struck her at the age of 25 and contributed to her death 14 years later was certainly not ambient in Chris's sense. Many people have been impressed by the strength and the humor that O'Connor expressed concerning her disease. Indeed, one of the most frequently quoted passages from her letters is this one. I have never been anywhere but sick. In a sense, sickness is a place more instructive than a long trip to Europe, and it's always a place where no one can follow. Scholars who have taken a cue from the statement have tended to follow one of two paths. The first is the one that O'Connor, as a Catholic, encouraged, an inquiry into the spiritual dimension and implications of suffering, in which illness and disability are seen as universal, a mark of human fallenness, and a sign of our need for redemption. The second, which has emerged more recently, is the lens afforded by the field of disability studies. I regard both approaches as potentially productive ways to understand O'Connor's account of illness, disability, and suffering, and of how we should respond to them. The major strength of the first approach is its reconciliation of the universal with the particular. We do not all suffer from disability or chronic illness, but we do suffer from other kinds of what O'Connor, following Teilhard de Chardin, called passive diminishments, and we cannot always overcome them. Acceptance of this knowledge can afford a powerful solace. At the same time, O'Connor's phenomenology of suffering, that no one can follow, rings true. Even if two people share the same illness or disability, their suffering, their responses to it, and the significance that they derive from it will not be the same. The major strength of the second approach, disability studies, is that it provides a source of solidarity. But I'm also aware of the obstacles that both of these approaches present. The first one will not be intuitively, sorry, will not be immediately intuitive to people who do not already share O'Connor's Christian faith, while the second has often proven an awkward fit for O'Connor because of what Bruce Henderson calls its identity politics-based scholarship. It seems undeniable, as Henderson maintains, that, quote, while there is, of course, a political consciousness in O'Connor's writing, her representation and rhetoric of disability is more theological and aesthetic. Moreover, the flip side of the solidarity that it generates is an exclusion. Those who are not disabled become marked with the stigma of privilege and their own contributions to conversations about these matters rendered suspect. I began with Chris's notion of ambient unwellness rather than with the more familiar reference points of Christian theology or disability studies, in part because I want to postpone a confrontation with these obstacles. More importantly, though, I want to propose that a key feature of our contemporary moment is the narrowing of the distance between objectively determinable forms of illness such as lupus or cancer, and the conditions that Chris describes. In doing so, I want to proceed very carefully. I'm not arguing that there is no difference between, say, a virus and a mood, nor am I denying that we might sometimes have grounds for suspicion about the existence or the severity of a given disorder. Con artists have always existed, and so has human error about the state of one's health. But I believe that Chris is onto something when he points out how much investment there is not only in techniques of self-optimization and in the consumer economy that multiplies them, but also in the way their upshot is to make illness, if not the only conceivable way of being a person, certainly one of the most powerful. And a world in which illness is universal is also a world that cries out for population management. In short, Although he does not make the connection explicit, I believe that Chris is tapping into the framework of biopolitics. As many know, this term was originally coined by Michel Foucault 
in the context of his lectures at the Collège de France in 1978. In his introductory lecture, Foucault states his intention to study the set of mechanisms through which the basic biological functions of the human species become the object of a political strategy, of a general strategy of power. To illustrate what he means, Foucault draws examples not only from the sphere of the judiciary, which he had discussed at length in his earlier book, Discipline and Punish, but from the field that we would today call public health. He suggests that over time, there's a movement away from measures seen as direct and punitive toward measures that are indirect and more dependent upon certain assumptions and abstractions. In the Middle Ages, for instance, and here we go to quote two on the handout, Regulations intended to combat the plague involve literally imposing a partitioning grid on the regions and towns struck by the plague, with regulations indicating when people can go out, how, at what times, what they must do at home, what type of food they must have, prohibiting certain types of contact, requiring them to present themselves to inspectors and to open their homes to inspectors. We can say that this is a disciplinary type of system. By the 18th century, however, when the first vaccines against smallpox were developed, the fundamental problem will not be the imposition of discipline, although discipline may be called into health, so much as the problem of knowing how many people are infected with smallpox, at what age, with what effects, with what mortality rate, lesions of after effects, the risks of inoculation, the probability of an individual dying or being infected by smallpox despite inoculation, and the statistical effects on the population in general. In short, it will no longer be the problem of exclusion, as with leprosy, or of quarantine, as with the plague, but of epidemics and the medical campaigns that try to halt epidemic or endemic phenomena. If you've read Discipline and Punish, this movement from direct to indirect means of achieving compliance should sound familiar. Once upon a time, authorities not only executed criminals, but also made gory public spectacles of their deaths, the better to impress upon the population the power of disciplinary authority in a visceral way. As we move toward the present moment, discipline certainly does not disappear, but it becomes both less brutal and more concealed. Surveillance, whether in the classic form of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, or in the ubiquitous security cameras that record most citizens of first world nations many times a day, renders more obviously punitive strategies of control less frequent. And the logistics of surveillance, how many cameras, where to position them, when to notify people that they are present, when to act upon whatever they record, increasingly become the subject of statistics and probability. In the 1990s, Foucault's framework of biopolitics was enormously expanded and refined in the work of Giorgio Agamben. In his major work, Homo Satya, Sovereign Power and Bare Life, Agamben begins with the distinction in the Greek language between zoe and bios. Both words translate as life in English, but zoe refers to life as a simple property shared by all living beings, animals, human beings, or gods, while bios refers to the form of life proper to a particular group. Human beings, of course, can be considered under either heading, but for the Greeks, only the framework afforded by bios, in the broadest sense this would be all human beings, and in a narrower one it would be all citizens of the polis, only the framework afforded by bios is properly political and ethical. This is so because the life of human beings, or citizens, in contrast to those of other animals, quote, is founded on a community not simply of the pleasant and the painful, but of the good and the evil, and of the just and the unjust. Zoe, conversely, can be described as bare life. It is what remains when we subtract our capacity for political and ethical reflection and focus only on our pleasant and painful sensations and on our continuation in time and space. A politics founded upon bios asks questions about the good and the just. A politics founded upon Zoe, which the Greeks would have considered no politics at all, concerns itself only with the maintenance, management, and if need be, destruction of bare life. Like Foucault, Agamben believes that the rise of biopolitics is associated with modernity. He notes, too, how this political shift 
often manifests as a movement from cruder to subtler forms of discipline and control. Yet Agamben also holds that Foucault does not go far enough. Combining Foucault's theory of biopolitics with Hannah Arendt's reflections on totalitarianism, Agamben argues that we see the ultimate logic of biopolitics in the Nazi death camps. But this logic is not, he insists, something foreign to or inseparable from the historical march of liberal democracy. As he puts it, this is quote three on the handout, the spaces, the liberties, and the rights won by individuals in their conflicts with central powers always simultaneously produce a tacit but increasing inscription of individuals' lives within the state order, thus offering a new and more dreadful foundation for the very sovereign power from which they wanted to liberate themselves. And only because biological life and its needs have become the politically decisive fact is it possible to understand the otherwise incomprehensible rapidity with which 20th century parliamentary democracies were able to turn into totalitarian states, and, which this, and with which this century's totalitarian states were able to be converted, almost without interruption, into parliamentary democracies. In both cases, these transformations were produced in a context in which, for quite some time, politics had already turned into biopolitics, and in which the only real question to be decided was which form or organization would be best suited to the task of assuring the care, control, and use of bare life. By now, you can probably see how I think that this biopolitical framework links to O'Connor's work. For those such as Jerome Foss, who have sought the wellsprings of O'Connor's political consciousness, her introduction to a memoir of Mary Ann has always been a key text. In its most quoted passage, O'Connor speaks of the modern tendency to use the suffering of children to discredit the goodness of God and of the political consequences that she believes follow from it. This is quote four. In this popular pity, we mark our gain in sensibility and our loss in vision. If other ages felt less, they saw more, even though they saw with the blind, prophetical, unsentimental eye of acceptance which is to say, of faith. In the absence of this faith now, we govern by tenderness. It is a tenderness which, long since cut off from the person of Christ, is wrapped in theory. When tenderness is detached from the source of tenderness, its logical outcome is terror. It ends in forced labor camps and in the fumes of the gas chamber. Foss's book about O'Connor's politics Leonard O'Connor and the Perils of Governing by Tenderness takes its title from this passage. But interestingly, it does not consider O'Connor's thought in connection with Foucault, Agamben, Arendt, or other theorists of biopolitics. I want to spend some time comparing this famous passage with what I have previously sketched in this talk. First, I would ask, why should it be the suffering of children rather than some other injustice or evil that looms so large in this context. I do not think it is only because, as O'Connor acknowledges, there are eloquent literary condemnations of God that take the suffering of children as their starting point. Above all, those voiced by Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov and Camus' Jean-Baptiste Clemence. A deeper reason might be that our widespread belief in the innocence of children is in many respects indistinguishable from a preoccupation with bare life. Children, after all, are pre-political and pre-ethical. They cannot vote or run for office, and they cannot be held fully responsible in a legal or moral sense when they injure others. Their opinions are sometimes quoted in political discourse, but we tend to regard them either sentimentally, as the expression of pure beings not yet corrupted by the evils of life, or cynically, as useful rhetorical tools for adults to exploit for their own political agendas. Mostly, children figure in political life as a class that requires protection. When they cannot be protected, either from the abuses of adults or from congenital forms of suffering, we might ask, as O'Connor suggested, not why they should die, but why they should be born in the first place. Perhaps O'Connor suggests that one way to think of a biopolitical world is as a place in which we are all becoming children, infantilized, subject to management for our own good, 
prevented from and increasingly incapable of making our own decisions. And perhaps Chris would add, not just children, but ill or disabled children. Even when we are encouraged to express ourselves and to make use of whatever ideas and consumer products might enable our autonomous self-fashioning, we might realize that these are presented to us as toys or as placebos, which distract us and prevent us from the more difficult work of becoming adults, from finding ways to be that might not be forms of illness. But I would argue that O'Connor also provides a corrective to the anti-humanist emphasis that we see in Foucault and Agamba. This corrective proves necessary precisely because their theories leave so little room for the possibility of an escape from creeping totalitarianism. What, after all, is the ultimate ex explanation for biopolitics in their work? For all that Agamben gestures toward a world of politics properly understood, in which human beings freely come together to deliberate in good faith about justice and the good life, the things that prevent such a world in his work are almost never human beings as such. It is not the king or the dictator who is the real oppressor, but sovereign power working through him. Similarly, in Foucault, it is not contestable ideas originating in the minds of individual men and women that wreak so much harm, but discourse speaking through them and constituting them as subjects in the first place. The only hope there might be an escape comes through a flight into the pre-discursive and the private. For instance, to bodies and pleasures instead of talk about sexuality, or to practices of self-care that might, in the end, be indistinguishable from a more highfalutin consumerism. Here's where Chris is dwelling upon the sheer number of products available to optimize the self again suggests itself. O'Connor, on the other hand, has no truck either with these totalizing abstractions or with the blandishments of consumer culture that we might seek refuge in. Though she argues against Ivan Karamazov and Clemence, she understands their protests against the suffering of children, not as the inevitable working out of impersonal forces, but as passionate and fully human expressions. So too are the passionate and fully human expressions of those nuns who sought to remember Marianne who saw, even in the suffering and brevity of her life, what O'Connor called the good under construction. There are many places in O'Connor's fiction where we might see her possible engagement with and critique of biopolitics. We might, for instance, speculate that Thomas, seeking to assert himself as an intellectual, is too beguiled and too infantilized by the comforts of home to see his situation clearly and that his inability to engage with adult sexuality and to achieve adult self-mastery might spring from this infantilization. We might ask how O'Connor's stories with children as protagonists, such as a temple of the Holy Ghost in the river, seek to trouble the association of children with bare life. But I would like to conclude this talk with some preliminary reflections on this theme in The Violent Buried Away. On the one hand, the character of Bishop seems to function as the clearest instance of bare life in O'Connor, since he is excluded not only from political life, as all children are, but from language itself by virtue of his disability, which appears to be Down syndrome. On the other hand, his father Raber seems an obvious example of one who governs by tenderness. He is appalled by the child evangelist Lucette Carmody because he recognizes her sincerity but can only see her as exploited, as a victim of degradation. She must be rescued, he thinks, but only because there is still hope for her to live the kind of productive and rational life that he considers worth living. It follows, though, that if there were no such hope, as there is not for Bishop, then killing her would be perfectly appropriate. As the narrator tells us, his normal way of looking on Bishop was as an X, signifying the general hideousness of fate. And he draws a properly modern conclusion from that premise. Nothing ever happens to that kind of child. In a hundred years, people may have learned enough to put them to sleep when they're born. Thus far then, Bishop and Raber seem to align well with Agamben's critique of biopolitics. It's precisely because Lucette and Bishop are constituted as bare life that Raber feels justified in trying to rescue her and to kill him. The bloodless utilitarian rationality that he espouses, or more accurately, aspires to, is marked by its impersonal 
and therefore what Agamben might call its sovereign character. It can also be no accident that Graeber echoes the language of the Nazis and their philosophical forebears, who spoke of Lebens unwertes Leben, that is, life that does not deserve to live. I believe, though, that O'Connor's critique proves subtler than this. In the first place, Graeber's ostensible tenderness is false, an act of violent will. It masks a fierce love that Graeber fights against with all his strength, a love that Graeber must describe to himself as idiot, and even as an expression of the same hereditary defect that he thinks made his uncle and his nephew into prophets. The Eastern Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart was probably not thinking of Graeber's inner struggle when he describes the antithesis between a materialist worldview and the one that he says characterizes Christianity, but he certainly could have been. This is quote five. For those who on the one hand believe that life is merely an accidental economy of matter that should be weighed by a utilitarian calculus of means and ends, and those who on the other believe that life is a supernatural gift oriented towards eternal glory, every moment of existence has a different significance and holds a different promise. To the one, a Down syndrome child, for instance, is a genetic scandal, one who should probably be destroyed in the womb as a kind of oblation offered up to the social good, and of course to some immeasurably remote future. To the other, that same child is potentially, and thus far already, a being so resplendent in his majesty, so mighty, so beautiful, that we could scarcely hope to look upon him with the sinful eyes of this life and not be consumed. If anything, though, Graeber's love is more radical than what Hart describes here. He considers an idiot because, quote, it was not the kind that could be used for the child's improvement or his own. It was love without reason, love for something futureless, love that appeared to exist only to be itself imperious and all demanding, the kind that would cause him to make a fool of himself. This is quote six, by the way. And it only began with Bishop. It began with Bishop and then like an avalanche covered everything his reason hated. To succumb to such a love is to recognize, quote, an impossible vision of a world transfigured. Many readers have noted that Raver's efforts to conquer his love entail a rigid ascetic discipline that is indistinguishable in many of its particulars from monastic life. Quote, he slept in a narrow iron bed, worked sitting in a straight-backed chair, ate frugal, spoke little. I detect no irony on the narrator's part when she states, he recognized that in silent ways he lived a heroic life, end quote, except perhaps in the potential for corruption that occurs whenever heroes recognize their own heroism. He also resembles Tarwater in that both are unusually aware of what they would consider their weaknesses and unusually committed to resisting them. In short, I believe that perhaps like the misfit in A Good Man is Hard to Find, Raber possesses an integrity that is not to be denied even if it ultimately, but debatably, leads to his own destruction. There is far more than tenderness at stake here. When I first read The Violent Buried Away many years ago, I concluded, as many readers have, that the novel's greatest flaw was the sheer implausibility of Raver as a character. Even Sally Fitzgerald, O'Connor's most ardent champion, thought so. Here's a quote from her. O'Connor's weaknesses, a lack of perfect familiarity with the terminology of the secular sociologists psychologists and rationalists she often casts as adversary figures, and an evident weighing of the scales against them are all present in the character of Raber. Harold Bloom is even blunter, calling Raber an aesthetic disaster because <laughs> O'Connor despises him and cannot bother to make him even minimally persuasive. O'Connor herself might have agreed. She certainly confesses in a letter to John Hawkes that Raber had been a stumbling block and that she, quote, didn't really know Raver or have the ear for him. I still understand the reasoning behind these judgments, and I even agree that at the time of the novel's publication, they might have been more persuasive. Returning to O'Connor's novel now, though, I find her portrayal of Raver prescient. It is precisely his struggle that seems most compelling now. He's smart enough to see the consequences of a regime in which the management of bare life is a central concern. He's arrogant enough to believe that he can wield this kind of sovereign power. But he's also perhaps humble enough 
to realize that he cannot eliminate the idiot love that so moves him. And his twisted monasticism is an expression of that humility. Perhaps this entails a strange kind of inverted wisdom. Just as Walker Percy suggests that we might be deranged if we weren't in fact depressed, perhaps O'Connor's point is that Graeber cannot be completely deranged as long as he's capable of being transported by this love. Indeed, one of the less remarked aspects of Graeber's character is that he appears in a more favorable light than Bernice, his estranged wife. Although she is far more committed to biopolitical management than Raber, and utterly untroubled by any kind of idiot love, Raber now regards her with hostility. We are told that she would not divorce him for fear of being given custody of the child, and she even demands that Raber institutionalize Bishop. He reacts with violence when she makes this demand, and we are told that his own behavior on that occasion was still a source of satisfaction to him. On an earlier occasion, she had persuaded Raber not to return to Powderhead to retrieve tar water after Mason had shot him. She explains that the reason is not, quote, that the child was dirty, thin, and gray. It was that its expression had no more changed when the gun went off than the old man's head. This had affected her deeply. It had, she said, the look of an adult, not of a child, and of an adult with immovable, insane convictions. She had had the sense seeing the child in the door, that it had known at that moment that all its future advantages were being stolen from it, its expression would not have altered a jot. He had thought all this was possibly her imagination, but he understood now it was not imagination, but fact. This seems like a precise delineation of the tendency to regard children as the epitome of bare life, and to consider them only in light of whether and how they can be managed for their own good. To be confronted with a child who will not inhabit this role is to call her beliefs dangerously into doubt. But instead of wrestling with this challenge, as River does, she simply flees to take up an unspecified managerial position, quote, as far away as she could get in Japan in some welfare capacity. The vagueness of, the descript of this description no doubt reflects River's contempt for her, but it might also point to the way in which in a biopolitical regime the tasks, roles, and even places assigned to specific individuals again become detached from any sense of human agency and serve increasingly unquestioned ideals of efficiency and productivity. Whatever it is that Bernice does, whether in her hometown or in Japan, seems unimportant when compared to the fact that it can be described as some welfare capacity. I hope I have succeeded in showing that O'Connor's work can be put into productive conversation with the work of Foucault and Agama, that she was quite prescient in understanding how both fascist and democratic regimes could become enthralled to the logic of biopolitics. I think that this work could perhaps be extended through an engagement with Hannah Arendt, with whose work O'Connor seems to have had some familiarity, and who, as Agama has argued, anticipates some of Foucault's ideas and takes them to one of their logical conclusions. O'Connor's concerns are worth heeding because the sway of biopolitics seems as strong as ever, as governments, corporations, and other large institutions adopt increasingly medical and statistical rationales for the management and control of large human populations. In the United States, we have not yet seen anything so draconian as, for instance, the assigning of a social credit score to citizens, as happens in China, or the outright pathologizing of political dissent as was common in the Soviet Union, let alone the relegation of entire groups of people to what the Nazis called life unworthy of life. Even so, the ongoing medicalization of life, as Chris has argued, and the politicization of medicine remain causes for grave concern. I hope that Agamben was exaggerating when he suggested in an interview in May of 2020 that one of the emerging lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic in Italy was that science and medicine, quote, act as a sort of religion whose God is bare life, and that, quote, citizens are being reduced to their bare biological existences. I hope so, but I'm not sure. Nor am I sure that he isn't right about this, or that this might not be precisely what ambient unwellness is all about. One more point. Earlier in this talk, I said that I wanted to approach biopolitics by way of Chris's idea of ambient unwellness in order to postpone a confrontation 
with O'Connor's Christian convictions on the one hand and with the field of disability studies on the other. But I should clarify here that this confrontation can only be postponed, not avoided. I've argued elsewhere that what seems best in the field of O'Connor studies is its openness to the clash of first principles. It's foregrounding of the fact that the multiplication of new things to talk about in no way moves us away from having to understand what is at stake in our disagreements. If I seem to be recommending here a new theoretical approach to O'Connor, afforded by the lens of biopolitics, it is not because I see this approach as trying to promote novelty. On the contrary, I think that this approach sheds additional life on what we already understand to be at stake, namely, what it means to be ill or disabled and how to confront that reality. I think that O'Connor herself would have relished this conversation. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Again, I'll, if you'll raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone. Questions or comments from the audience? Thank you so much for your really thought-provoking talk. And it has me thinking about the move that O'Connor makes in the introduction to the memoir of Marianne, that she starts as often happens with her humorous story about trying to put the people off um, who wanted, wanted her to write a whole book um, and said, I'll write the introduction. But there seems to be an interesting move that she makes from her own kind of cynicism and satirism to actually learning about Marianne and a kind of conviction that happens. I wonder if you talk about like if that move that she makes herself um, has relevance to your larger argument. Yeah, um, I think that O'Connor addresses this very clearly when she talks about the way this project has helped her reconsider her use of the grotesque and the way she says she now thinks of good as something under construction too. Um, so how does that relate to, to what I've been talking about? I wonder if the idea here is, you know, O'Connor is not thinking about biopolitics when she is initially um, unwilling to write this. It's all about because she just hates the thought of writing, you know, what, what does she say? a novel, horrors, um, she, she, she wants nothing to do with this, um, because of her fear of sentimentality. I wonder if that's the connection. I wonder if the connection here is um, O'Connor's well-attested dislike of sentimentality taps into a preoccupation with bare life. I wonder if that's what the connection is. And then what O'Connor needs to get over, um, so to speak, in order to write the introduction is to move away from what might be a knee-jerk reaction to that. Yeah, um, yeah that, 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 that's, that's what I'm initially thinking. Do you have more thoughts about that? I would like to borrow. Okay, okay. <laughs> did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, my name's Calvin. Uh, I'm with the NEH Institute. Thank you for, for that talk. Um, biopolitics is something I'm I'm really interested in kind of as uh, an object of study. Um, something that interests me about Foucault, I think, uh, why I find him more interesting than Agamben personally is, his way of reading is very much uh, through this lens of the dispositive, like this, um, this heterogeneous collection of institutions, practices, that all together with you know, the juridical structures um, managed life and you know in his books it's as diverse as uh, mental hospitals schools jails all of these um, in a way that kind of that I think keeps power as a concept from becoming too abstract I see him very much locating it in how practices happen in those institutions I was wondering if you can say because those institutions show up a lot in the violent bear it away there's this rejection of the school, there's this refusal to send Bishop to the, uh, to the um, mental hospital, there's uh, this educational journal, there's the welfare office, the welfare woman. I'm just curious how these institutions are kind of positioned and, and how those, that kind of tangible expression of power, how those dynamics work with the characters. I, I think I would agree with that. Um, obviously, Foucault is not talking just about public health. He sees any kind of institution as potentially, and perhaps ultimately always, becoming um, 
a structure in this way. Um, the, the, the way I read Foucault is that I think Foucault really believes that you cannot outrun these things forever. You can, you can only stage sort of rear guard actions, so to speak. Um, so in The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, um, let's stop talking about sexuality because it has become an oppressive discourse. Let's take our refuge instead in bodies and pleasures. Um, I think the point is that you can only do that for so long. Some, some eventually power will catch up with you. Um, so this is, this is what I would say is the, the limits of Foucault. And while although I, I think he is very much onto something here, um, I, I, want to, I want to argue that there is less of a totalizing framework here. I want to argue that it's possible for some real kind of freedom. Um, but, but to speak to what I agree with, it. I think that it is not just um, the discourse of health, of bare life that we see, but all of those other things. Um, I'm thinking of the, uh, the article that Ray Bird wants to write. You know, oh boy, you're a type that's almost extinct. Um, even scholarly discourse can become one of these things, um, which is something that honestly sometimes gives me a little pause. <laughs> so um, do, you, do you have any other thoughts about that? Or? Yeah, I, I think that there's, like, you see a little bit of that resistance from all of the characters. There's this refusal to institutionalize this, um, maybe flee to nature, flee to kind of, kind of this mm -hmm. backwoods religion. Seems to be something that she's kind of feeling out as an alternative to uh, this kind of totalizing biopower. Um, whether that's successful and whether that actually escapes it, I think is, is difficult to see uh, with how the novel ends. But there's, yeah. she seems to be feeling out some of these alternatives in uh, Old Tarwater um, as well as Francis, yeah. Yeah, um, what, one of the things that, that has always puzzled me about what O'Connor says is, um, this is this is in a famous letter where she's defending the violent buried away. She talks about her, um, her sense of indebtedness to Hawthorne, which she also talks about in Memoir of Marianne. Um, but she describes uh, the old man as a natural Catholic. And I've always thought that's so strange because of course he is certainly not a Catholic. He would not understand himself that way. Um, you can see that O'Connor wants to suggest he has something like a Catholic understanding of the Eucharist. It's all about the bread of life. It's all about these magic. I wonder if there's a way we could, we could stretch this a little and make it work with what we're talking about here. Catholicism as an institution, um, of course, will tell you in great detail what its doctrines are. Um, you can read the Catechism of the Catholic Church to find them out, and O'Connor, of course, as a Catholic, believed in them. But I wonder if part of what she's going with with the old man and why she describes him as a natural Catholic is she, too, wants to suggest that there is something prior to or before the institutionalization of something. If the old man were a Catholic, and would say, you know, I believe in what the Catholic Church teaches, it wouldn't work. Um, O'Connor wants to see some value in the fact that he is just doing what he does, and even though he gives reasons why, um, it is not institutionalized in any way. Um, I've never thought about that before, but I, I thank you. That, I think that's helping me make a connection of something that's always puzzled me. John Davis, uh, I'm here with the NEHSI. Um, this may require a little bit of crystal ball thinking, but I'm curious as to your answer. Uh, at one time, my own son, who is now going into college, had 100,000 followers on TikTok. Um, the reason I bring that up is because there is a phenomenon that seems to be occurring in the social media of our adolescence, where they see um, videos and other media from people their age talking about things like ADHD, talking about things like psychological conditions, and then self-diagnosing with those conditions themselves. Uh, well, I lost focus in class today, therefore I must have ADHD. Um, sometimes those are gateways to actual diagnoses, but many times they are simply adolescents being adolescents. I'm wondering how you believe from the research that you have done, Flannery O'Connor would perceive this phenomenon that is happening as a result of things like TikTok, things like 
social media and adolescents self-diagnosing? Um, I think that what you were talking about is not a new phenomenon. I mean, I've, I've read accounts of uh, people who go to medical school, and at some point everybody becomes convinced that they have some very rare disease, um, that their symptoms match it to a T, and this is almost never true. Um, I think that this kind of um, susceptibility is a very real thing, and I think that social media can magnify this tremendously. Um, I think that O'Connor would have agreed that this is a real problem. Um, I don't know what she would have said about theorizing it as, as, as something that we, so yeah, I, I don't know how to answer the question in terms of what would she say about the specific manifestation. Um, do, you, do you have more in mind about that? Or? No, I, it, it, it's a good question, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. Tom, I'm gonna step in and ask one quick question. Sure. Uh, it really builds off of Calvin's idea. Are you at all, find it remarkable or, or interesting that among those institutions that are clearly satirized in the, in the, in the, in the violent is the church as an institution because she turns outside of it for, for Lucette. Lucette does not belong to any traditional religion at all, and yet that's the only kind of religious value that we see as well as with the, with the old man. The church, she may want to call him a natural Catholic, but we, we in a huge city, we never run across any cathedrals. Right, right. Um, I, I wonder what part of, part of what you are um, making me think of um, is not from the Ballad of away but uh, the, the, the guy that Hayes um, convinces in Wise Blood to go to the whorehouse, who is a lapsed Catholic. And what's <laughs> funny about that is uh, Hayes is trying to convince him, of course, that there's no such thing as sin, and he says, uh, no, what we have done is a mortal sin, and we will go to hell if we die right now. Um, but can we go again tomorrow night? Um, <laughs> so I find that really an amusing bit, because it is satire on the one. O'Connor is poking fun at people who will say, I am a Catholic and yet act otherwise. Um, but on the other hand, she would say that what that young man says is not untrue. He's got the doctrine right, even if he is not, not, not living that way. So I, I think that that is, you, you use the word satire. I think that that would be a, a, a better example of O'Connor satirizing the church um, than what you see in the Bible and Barry, where it's mostly just absent. Um, and as you say, Lucette is not a member of any Christian denomination that, that um, I am aware of, um, although, although now I'm second-guessing myself and maybe I need to go back and verify that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on uh, the point that you started on about, uh, or early in your talk about O'Connor studies being a fruitful, a, a place where disagreements are in some way productively unavoidable, um, which I think was a, a kind of thread and theme throughout as well, and that I know you've written on in other places. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but I'm wondering what you have to say about disagreements as we find them in O'Connor's texts. I was thinking about that and thinking about the many times that disagreements are played for laughs in sort of reflecting a kind of radical shared incomprehension. Um, I'm sorry, radical what? Like shared incomprehension, so incomprehension. So like the, the priest in the enduring chill who comes and tries to proselytize to Asbury in, uh, Asbury was expecting this aesthetically formed Jesuit and it's uh, sort of blustery old, is it Father, I don't remember what his name is, uh, the purgatory priest. Um, but there are a lot of moments like this. I, it, it, I don't know whether this is true, but it seems as, as though O'Connor seems to prefer dialogue of incomprehension over actual sort of engagement. So maybe you could challenge that premise or simply reflect on what O'Connor's sort of dramatization of argument has to say in relation to what you said about O'Connor's mm -hmm. studies as a place for argument. 
That, that, that's a really good question. It's something that I have thought about a lot um, and, and that honestly um, flummoxes me a little bit. Because on the one hand, I believe that these kinds of disagreements are unavoidable um, and I believe they should not be shied away from. On the other hand, I, I do think there is a limit to how productive they can be. Um, and in fact, one, one of the, um, Bob, Bob mentioned um, the essay that I wrote in his, uh, his co-edited collection. Um, that's, that's precisely what this is about. One of, one of the things that I say there is that when I, when I started out writing about O'Connor, um, I was always trying to find new things to say. I was, I was, I was trying to avoid getting into arguments um, about the sort of fundamental debates that we always keep coming back to um, because I wanted to be productive. I wanted to say something new. Um, and I realized at a certain point that I didn't think I could avoid that, um, that these debates are not only going to continue whether I come up with something new to say or not, but that whatever all of us come up with will end up figuring back into that debate. Um, so this is a real question that, that, that I have. And I guess I would say, I think that when O'Connor uses humor as a way to, to deal with this, um, it certainly can sometimes be cruel. It certainly can seem as if it is not taking an antagonist seriously. Um, but I have a, a kind of working theory, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I would go to Matt for this yet, but I think that part of what O'Connor is doing is that humor um, is something that might work just as well as, maybe even better than, um, what she calls her strategy of the grotesque. In other words, if you have two parties who are disagreeing with each other, and they know going into it that their premises are irreconcilable so that it's going to be hard to sort of break it down and say, where can we find some common ground? I wonder if O'Connor thinks the only way, or one of the only ways to have a conversation would be to say, well, here's something that will make you laugh. Maybe this will take us a little bit outside of this. It's not going to make the debate go away. It may not even change anybody's mind, but will decenter it slightly. Um, that is what I have to say um, about something I've been thinking for a long time, and I don't know if that makes any sense or not. Um, but does, does, does that answer your question? Anyone else? Well, then Dr. Haddix, I want to thank you very much for your time and giving us this wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. For having me.